Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Now I'm very happy to introduce our next guest, which is actually a special guest. Connected with us from Boston, Massachusetts, is Professor Massimiliano Versace, who is the, uh, the co-founder and CEO of Neurala and founding director of the Boston University Neuromorphics Lab. In addition to that, Mr. Versace has, really, has a really remarkable background. After graduation at the University of Trieste in Italy, he holds two PhDs. He worked with the DARPA, with the NASA, with the National Science Foundation and other agencies to develop a one-of-a-kind AI able to run on any device. Today, his company's AI powers millions of devices worldwide. So good afternoon or good morning to the United States, Professor Versace, and thanks for being with us. Good morning, a pleasure being here. Professor, I know that you are about to share some secrets of artificial intelligence, but before that, would you like to briefly introduce to us Neurala and its activities? Yeah, absolutely. So once the, the secret is shared, it's no more secret, right? So uh, <laughs> absolutely. So I, I started the company alongside Heather and Anatoly to uh, my colleague at Boston University in 2006. It was an outgrowth of uh, research we did, uh, as you mentioned, with NASA, DARPA, at Boston University, and uh, you know, many many years later, as the industry matured, uh, we started to take this technology down from uh, uh, from Mars, where where it was supposed to run into more terrestrial applications. So after many many years waiting for uh, you know the right application to come out, we deployed our AI in uh, almost 60 million devices, and uh, right now we are looking at uh, scaling up uh, um, the deployment of the technology in uh, industrial manufacturing among all the various sectors. And so I'll, uh, I'll tell you about the journey which took us from uh, you know, designing stuff for Mars all the way down into our production lines. Okay, well then Professor, I'm sure that everybody here can't wait to hear and see your keynote about artificial intelligence. So the stage is yours. Beautiful. Thank you. And it's a pleasure uh, being virtually again in, in, in Italy with my friends at IMA. As, uh, uh, as I was mentioning, I've been in artificial intelligence for many years. And uh, uh, now that AI has become commonplace among uh, uh, you know, not only scientists and geeks like me, but virtually everybody, uh, it's interesting to, to think about what is the mission of this AI. Many of us uh, imagine intelligence. These are the images, uh, robotic, uh, you know, humanoid robots, robotic dogs, um, more uh, le less probable robotic kangaroos or dinosaurs and snakes. And, you know, when, when people think about AI and robotics, uh, these are fir the fir uh, things that come to mind. But that's, that's very misleading. Uh, incarnation about AI are most often very, very different from the uh, Hollywood-based uh, images that, uh, that were in the prior slide. Um, first, first of all, the AI market is not a fantasy, it's real. It's uh, projected to be about $120 billion by 2025. And here I collected just a few of uh, the, the verticals or the, 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 the applications that are present today, uh, from agriculture to automotive, uh, government, retail, healthcare, media, so, uh, data, cybersecurity, legal, and of course, uh, uh, also industrial. So these are all different incarnations than dinosaurs and kangaroos, but they're very real applications that run today in uh, millions of different environments. Well, what about manufacturing? Manufacturing and AI, it's uh, um, you know, an intersection that is becoming very real and very interesting and uh, uh, business worthy. So the projected cover for uh, the adoption of artificial intelligence in manufacturing is spectacular. So we, the, the forecast is going from a, a mere billion in 2018 to uh, almost 18 billion at, at the end of 2025. Among all the different AIs, and uh, we'll unpack what AI means in a second, uh, deep learning, which is a subfield of AI that really has attracted most of the attention uh, for good reasons, uh, has the lion's share of, of this development. And among deep learning, the one that actually lives on the device, meaning at the edge or on-premise, is the one that uh, is the more important uh, in terms of uh, what's, what's uh, uh, feasible to do in, uh, in the manufacturing environment. So deep learning on-prem. And then of course there is 2020 with the addition of a twist, which is uh, of course coronavirus. 
the pressure is on even more manufacturing. They have to rely even less on, uh, on human presence. They have to increase efficiency and productivity and maintain and improve quality. So all of these uh, the trends uh, towards improvement are not disappearing. Reduce waste, optimize machines, and uh, it ensure line flexibility and changeovers because of uh, uh, flexible demands. AI plus automation is the main uh, combination that ensures the manufacturing can actually do the, the, what, what I said about and uh, uh, deal with uh, scatter and reduce workforce and uh, you know, produce the same or more than before. So where are we in, uh, in the long journey uh, uh, towards the industry 4.0? So today we are roughly at stage three. So we are able, after uh, um, a good amount of digitization of uh, industrial manufacturing, we are able to collect uh, data, right? So we have visibility on the data. And now we are going towards step four, which is, well, now that I have all this data, what is this data about? What is it telling me? And it's important to understand that data collection per se is not a panacea. It's not going to tell you anything other than having a big, large bucket with data. The real step is going from three to four, which is going from the visibility to understanding. So the, the, the interpretation of this data is really the, uh, the key. And uh, the way to do that is, in fact, with AI. There is, there is no way in which a, a, a human operator will sift through this huge amount of data. And we have seen this in many fields before, working with NASA and the DOD and DARPA. The, the first step is data collection and then, oops, now that I have all this data, how do I interpret it? And so natural step forward is artificial intelligence. So what is this artificial intelligence all about? Well, for, fortunately, we know much more than we did uh, 20 years ago when I entered the field, um, which I was uh, a humble one. Uh, we're able to decode mathematically uh, the basic functioning of the human brain or animal brain, if you will and uh, translate that into software. So the, the 100 billion neurons and trillions of synapses that make up our brain can be today uh, mathematically dissected and then reassembled in computer code that uh, is very, very far from uh, our own capability, but still at the level which makes the application interesting and useful for uh, a real world scenario. Oops. So artificial intelligence has been in, uh, around uh, for way longer than I was alive. A very old uh, discipline. And uh, for that, that, we today have a, a, a so-called good old-fashioned AI. So we have a prehistory of AI, and we have uh, the so-called neural networks, which is uh, the real name for deep learning technology. So good old-fashioned AI, again, has been around since the 40s. And is, it relies on a, a very simple but powerful process, which is uh, the decomposition of a problem from a scientist into uh, actionable step that can be explicitly designed. So that, let's imagine that uh, a good, uh, a GoFi scientist wants to build a vision system that distinguishes between an apple and an orange. So it will create sort of a decision tree, which is uh, the thing depicted on the left, which goes something like, is the thing that I'm looking at a fruit? If yes, is the shape roundish? If yes, is the color green? Then you start to navigate through this tree and get eventually to apple. Very radically different approaches for neural networks, where the intelligence is actually all the way uh, before the design of these rules. It's 100% concentrated in the design of the mathematical rules that connect these elementary processes, which are neural and synapses, exactly how our brain is designed. And that's where the intelligence of the scientist stops. And then you use data to build up these rules. So you present data pretty much uh, how humans you know, uh, learn throughout their lifetime. And the neural network changes is structured to accommodate the, the difference between, for instance, uh, an apple and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and an orange. And intuitively, we know that this is how people learn. So this is uh, an example of my uh, Versace 3.0 and 4.0. So this is Aria on the right. And uh, the poor guy on the, on the left is my fourth kid, uh, Leonardo. And by observing them, uh, and I wish I could sit around here with things, having them do the things that I want. But in reality, what they do is they find things and they create decision trees uh, purely based from me. Okay. 
guys I have a little uh, Professor, I don't know if you can hear me. We are facing some issues with your audio connection. So if you could just hold on for a second, we try to fix that and get you back in full quality. Just you can give us a couple of seconds. See what our director is saying. Can you hear me, Professor? It looks like we have lost the connection with Boston. We'll do our best to re-establish it. Okay, the technicians are telling me that it's, uh, the problem is not here with our connection, but with the connection of our guest speaker, Professor Versace. We hope that he can fix it as quickly as possible. Because we were all We've all been uh, looking and listening to his fascinating keynote about artificial intelligence and deep learning. Okay, can Professor, you hear me again? I can, can hear you, you but hear yeah, I can hear you. They're not giving me a picture now, but let's see. Okay, now I can see you. Now I can see you. So maybe if you can go back three slides. I think we lost you about three slides ago. So uh, can you see the slide, what about manufacturing? Yes. Yes, I apologize, uh, people, I, I am... Uh, I think we, we, started, we started losing you when uh, there were still the two babies uh, ah. on, on, the, on, the, on the presentation. When we were still watching the two babies. Yeah, it was the end yes. of, of this slide, I, I think. Perfect. So, okay, so let's try again. Yeah, you said you, you wanted to teach them something. Yes, I wanted to teach them something, but I failed, right? So, the, <laughs> of course, any, any, anybody who has uh, babies, they understand that the majority of the learning is actually happening in a fairly unsupervised fashion by just having them exposed to so-called data or their environment. And so, as I was mentioning, in uh, academia, uh, first, uh, deep learning and the uh, neural network started to uh, overcome a good old-fashioned AI in a, in a tremendous way, winning essentially all the um, competitions um, in a, um, you know, traditional competition that are that happen in, in academia around written language recognition, traffic sign, and medical imaging. So deep learning and neural network started to win uh, against all good old-fashioned AI that were more powerful um, techniques. And then uh, they started to flood the real world. And this, this example here shows you uh, a few video application of uh, what actually my company in Iran over the years. And uh, as I was mentioning at the beginning, we put our AI in about uh, 56 million devices, uh, ranging from cell phones, as you've seen in the prior video, where our solution was running in uh, uh, consumer cell phones to help understand and uh, uh, segment the image and create stunning pictures by essentially having an artificial intelligent um, professional photographer every time you took a picture with your cell phone and then transition to larger devices like drones, in this case, to help uh, uh, inspect uh, uh, infrastructure completely autonomously. So you don't have to send the person up to, uh, for instance, a wind turbine or a power distribution structure, but you can send the drone equipped uh, with artificial uh, intelligence. And then all the way to robotics, as this, sh this shows, where we put our AI in uh, uh, hundreds of robots that are roaming grocery stores in the United States. So this uh, technology from academia in the, in the course of, uh, you know, just you know, a decade have become a, a huge reality for, for many applications. But what about, what about manufacturing? So manufacturing is obviously um, a sector that benefits uh, a lot from artificial intelligence. And uh, it is even considering pre-pandemic uh, trends, right? So the majority of manufacturing were already signed in alarm bells uh, the, the, um, with, for the labor shortage. So people do not want to go and work in factories if they have another choice as, as a baseline. So a huge labor shortage compounded by the fact that traditional machine vision, as we have seen, is not good enough to solve real world uh, applications that many of these manufacturers need to solve. And you started to see some acquisition from, uh, uh, you know, companies like Cognex and others 
uh, of startups that uh, started to design uh, this new deep learning te technology as the transition into manufacturing seemed to be unavoidable. And in fact, that has happened. Uh, application of artificial intelligence in manufacturing are already happening, for instance, in a component presence. So checking whether the expected items are in, in a box to label inspection. So today, uh, older age is personalized ca custom packaging. And uh, you, what you need to, do to inspect those packages uh, is having a flexible AI system that can be trained on very customized things or uh, logistic, ensuring that pallets uh, arrive in, in good condition and, uh, and uh, you can compare defects uh, with respect to what is expected from these pallets. Though, you know, AI and deep learning in particular are not miracle technology. They are just technology. And like every other technology, they have very, very specific uh, uh, operating condition and caveats and, uh, if you will, defects, right? So let's understand together what is it like to build an artificial intelligence system in an industrial setting, in a production setting, like in a bottling facility. Imagine that you need to inspect the quality of your caps. And uh, as you can see, caps uh, come in all sorts of sh shapes. It's pretty much the same, but uh, very different patterns in it. And so how do you build a deep learning technology that is able to inspect whether your cap is uh, doing fine or not? So the way you do it is you collect thousands of images of these caps. And uh, for each type of cap, right, for each quality of cap, you need to collect uh, all possible anomalies that are going to occur in that cap. Very importantly, you need to have uh, what in uh, deep learning jargon is called a balanced data set. So you need a, 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 enough images of good uh, compared to bad. So you need 50 images of bad or 50 images of good for each cap. Then you train it for hours or days, and once you train this uh, deep learning technology, it's fixed. You cannot change it unless you go back to step one and redo everything. The big issue among all the issues that I told you about is the balanced data set, right? So in, in a, fortunately, in a production setting, the number of defects that come out from industrial machine is really, is really small. So you never have 50% uh, of your images that are anomalous, thankfully. And so how do you do it? Well, uh, fortunately, the brain comes to the rescue. Um, it's uh, uh, very innate for us to understand something normal. So to look, to look for instance, to the picture of the, the Mona Lisa and uh, look, uh, look on the right and find out almost immediately without any effort that there is an anomaly with respect to the standard, right? And so you, we, do, we do this very, very easily because we continuously match what our expectation of normal is uh, from an image or from an experience to uh, what actually comes to our senses. And so that's what we have uh, encapsulated in, uh, in our uh, deep learning technology, working again for many years with DARPA and NASA and how we transition into, into the product. And what does that mean for manufacturing? Well, it means that uh, you can change completely the paradigm. You can just collect a bunch of uh, uh, good images, in this case, run your production setting, check that there are no defects, which is 99% or 9% uh, of the cases, and then that's it. You train just on good stuff, and then you deploy your AI. And whenever there is a deviation from this golden standard, your AI is going to alert it. And you can do this in minutes uh, without uh, having to know uh, anything about the underlying AI. So let me show you something in practice. Uh, you know, this was all, all theory, but how does it work in practice in a production setting? And uh, here we have taken strides forward with our uh, partner, Ima, uh, over the course of the many past months. So this is actually a video. I'd like to play this. Uh, um, if you guys can hear, hear the sound, please let me know. Defects in a bottle cap inspection line quickly and easily using our platform, Brain Builder. Uh, can you guys hear the sound uh, remotely? Acceptable and any defective images that you have, if available, and let our patented AI do the hard work. Set a region of interest to remove confusing background information from what the model actually learns. Then evaluate the performance with relevant metrics, moving to a test deployment scenario in minutes rather than days. You just saw end-to-end -end building a custom model to automate visual inspections in seconds, making it easier for you to move to a 100% visually inspected product line. Perfect. So here you've seen an example of how you can quickly and easily configure an AI system for quality inspection. 
So how easy is to this technology that you've just seen to integrate and maintain? Well, it's extremely easy. You probably have everything you, you need on site right now. You have an industrial PC, an industrial network, and uh, a, a, any gig camera. You don't need to buy any special hardware or know anything about machine vision or AI, as you, you, you've seen, it's just point and click on the screen. And what happens if my line change? Nothing, you just redo the very simple steps above and uh, change the AI model on the spot. So uh, an order of magnitude simpler than what uh, the expectation of a traditional machine vision was. Well, that's just for vision, right? And uh, we all know that industrial machine have a plethora of sensors and then we talked about the stage of digitization in Industry 4.0. The sensor information from those sensors is already being collected as we speak. So there is a lot going on beyond vision. And uh, uh, let's think about what is the, uh, the cost of an unexpected downtime on an industrial machine when something breaks in it. Uh, in 2006, so this is all statistics, it was $260,000 per hour uh, and lasted four hours. This was the minimum, the average unplanned downtime for an industrial machine. So we know we can harvest the data uh, from, from, uh, from this machine before uh, eventually the machine goes down. So we can use this information, not too much about stopping the machine from going down, but being strategic when we take this machine out of service. So how can this be done? And this is where our collaboration with EMA is starting to give uh, uh, its, uh, uh, its return on investment. So we, in, in this example, we, as a coffee capsule, so that's, that's our first application with EMA, as, as this operates, a sensor check the quality of the seal applied at each machine, machine cycle. The sensor data can then be used uh, for each capsule to and fed into an artificial intelligence system. So today you're gonna see a sneak preview of uh, what we have called Neurala Multisensor Intelligent Automation or MIA. And that's uh, what the product uh, is going to start to look like as we uh, design it uh, in collaboration with IMA. So we'll have the ability to select a particular sensor and we'll have the ability to feed pretty much like you've seen in the vision example uh, with DIA. We'll have the ability to feed uh, multi-sensor data. In this case, for instance, would be a pressure sensor and just use this good data to train what a good uh, production cycle is with the machine. And then what we do, we just deploy it and we use this uh, quickly trained artificial intelligence system to spot the anomaly exactly as we did in vision but in this case, we're in a completely different domain. We're in a, in, a, in a sensor domain that is different from vision. So this is extremely exciting for us. And it's a, a, it's a step towards uh, intelligent and autonomous machines in the sense that the, the machine starts to become more aware of what's good and what's bad and can alert the operator before something goes astray. So at the end of the day, what, it, what is important is the end customer satisfaction. And uh, in this particular case, it's improving ceiling quality and uh, uh, plan the maintenance rather than having some plan that occur without uh, any, any, any prior advice. So in 2020, it, to, to us is the year of AI got accelerated also for external factors, which were not easy to forecast and being adopted into industrial machines. And this kind of AI that uh, we are seeing being deployed is very different from machine vision. It's simple, you don't need to be an expert and you don't need any special equipment. It's responsive in, a, in the sense that uh, you can enable flexibility within existing machines and it's dynamic. You can gather images or defects as you go and it's very easy to augment and update your AI. So a, a stark departure from a traditional machine vision. But uh, you know, as we go towards the end of 2020, it's uh, inevitable that we glance uh, beyond uh, 2020 and what's coming in 2021, 22, and et cetera. And in order for us to understand the future, it's uh, very, very important to look at our past. And uh, as Neurala, we have worked to build artificial brains for complex machines like Mars Rover, which have a plethora of sensors and need to uh, adapt in real time to an uncharted environment. Like by definition, Mars was not charted until we started to able to adapt. And uh, in, uh, there, is a there is a very strong similarity, or if you will, a shared complexity between autom autonomous robots and industrial machines. On the left, you see the typical sensor array of a Mars rover, and uh, a camera is just one of the many sensors that uh, these devices have. 
And on the right, you see uh, you know, uh, another machine which doesn't have uh, wheels or tracks, but has an equally impressive or even larger uh, set of sensor from vacuum sensor, temperature, motor, force sensor, pressure sensor, and ceiling checks. So all these sensors, uh, beside being there to be collected in terms of a data stream, they can provide very, very deep insights into what the machine is doing and uh, how these different sensors inform each other. In particular, if coffee cups, if one of the sensor goes uh, astray and starts to give information, have a camera. So then this information uh, in our brains when we have a mismatching sensor information. So the, the future of uh, industrial machine is very similar to what the future of autonomous robots uh, and for mass exploration uh, has become, which is to have a brain, a dedicated or with sensor, but integrates this information to understand uh, what is going on in the machine. And the trick is that each machine is actually different from the, its cousin. So each machine has a very different footprint, different sensor, is producing different using different uh, uh, products. And so you need something that is really flexible to understand what normal is for that very particular production run and being able to, to spot anomalies as uh, the flexibility of this machine goes into different operational modes. So the what I call here the virtual cycle of industry 4.0 is really about connecting the dots between the data and the AI. Collecting the data will only take you halfway through the circle what closes the circle is really the artificial intelligence that integrates this data and understands what, what is happening in the machine. So to me, this is a very exciting uh, future uh, that lies ahead beyond 2020. We're going to be able to do more with less. Uh, many sensors, uh, as we mentioned, are already in the machine because we are collecting tons of data out of them. So we don't have to do anything special on the, on the hardware, if you will. Uh, it's going to be a customized approach. Each machine, as I mentioned, is different. And it's, each machine needs its own brain, pretty much like a rover needed its own brain. Each machine has its own uh, unique brain that can be trained on what normal is for that particular machine and production run. And it's going to be predictive. Uh, AI will be using information from multiple sensors, as I mentioned, to tell the operator what's wrong and point to, to possible causes, thanks to the wide range of information that the, this AI is, is, is able to consume. So it's a very uh, exciting future for us. Uh, we are definitely moving, uh, taking steps ahead towards an AI power industry 4.0, working closely with customers and, and partners really like EMA that see this reality as a, a compelling uh, activity to, to prepare us for an unavoidable future with more intelligent machines. Thank you and apologize for the connection. Hopefully you can, uh, you, you've heard the rest of the presentation. Thank you, Professor Vrasace. Indeed, it's going to be a very exciting future and we're all looking forward to experience it. So, uh, in the meantime, we have received one question from, from one of our uh, viewers at home. And he is asking, have you had other experiences with end users in the manufacturing sector except or besides EMA? Yes, we do. And uh, we actually have launched uh, um, a, a few weeks ago uh, our uh, 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 Neural Abia, which is visual inspection automation. That's the product I, I showed you um, before. Um, it, we launched our uh, partner network uh, initiative and we, have, uh, uh, we are currently sailing to, to, towards 10 partners that are distributing our technology uh, virtually in every continent. So we do have uh, several, uh, several activities and several customers um, system integrators and customers like the Fortune 100 uh, uh, production uh, facilities um, that, that uh, produce, in this case, consumer goods. Um, so the adoption that we are seeing is really furious at this point. Um, and I think there is a uh, COVID-19 has played a role in creating a sense of urgency in uh, uh, manufacturers all over the world to integrate this technology and, and become a little bit more less reliant on a spotty workforce. 
Okay, well, that's it as far as our viewers' questions are concerned. Professor, thank you very much for being with us and for contributing to this edition of the Sensing Future Day. So best of greetings to Boston. My pleasure, thank you. So dear viewers, we have come to the end of this session. We take a very short break and we'll be right back with the last of today's sessions. Don't miss it. <laughs>